So I hope you people already aware that SAS is one of the uh, important tool in the market which is used for the data analytics purpose. Basically it is used in different domain. For example, you can use the SAS tool for the data manipulation, data migration, data integration and a lot of things you can do with the SAS environment. Okay, so with the introductory part, we are going to share the agenda for, with you that we will go going to share the introduction to SaaS system, then uh, snapshot to the predictive modeling, then we are going to share the knowledge area in the BFSI module, then the knowledge area related to the marketing, and we will share some examples uh, on the basis of application of SaaS into these uh, different domains. So, Basically, SaaS is a data-driven task. You will be able to access your data, manage data, analyze the data, and present the data within the SaaS environment or outside of the SaaS environment because SaaS giving us the flexibility that we can write the code and submit directly inside the SaaS or outside of the SaaS with the non-interactive mode. So Foundation SaaS provides the following that basically it just giving you a graphical user interface which helps us to administrating SaaS tasks. For example, you're writing any SaaS program like data step or proc step, you can write down inside the SaaS environment. Or you can just able to use some function within the SaaS environment. We can generate some macro as well. So SaaS is giving us a rich library of the SaaS procedures. Okay, SaaS is able to means you can install it anywhere. It is platform independent that you can install it Windows, Unix, Linux, mainframes. Because SaaS proclaim themselves as they are the independent vendor, so you, you can able to extract the data from any source, whether it's a DB2, Oracle, Teradata, or any of the database. Just you need to have an access license with you. So basically, we in the SaaS, we have different components. We may generate some reporting and graphics with the help of SaaS graphs and SaaS stats there. We have the data access and management. We will be able to generate some kind of analytical thing with the help of SaaS stats. Visualization and discovery is a part of mining. And the base SaaS is the core part of the foundation SaaS. Okay, so in the foundation SaaS, you will going to work on the SaaS environment and you will able to administrating the SaaS task inside the environment. So basically when you talk about the functionality of the SaaS, so the SaaS will give you the, to access the data from any source, then you can manage and manipulate the data. Once the manager management and the manipulation is done, then you go with the data analysis. In the data analysis, you will just go with the statistical tool which is provided by the SaaS because I believe you people are from the business background so you can understand that while we are working on the SaaS or any other tool, we need to generate some kind of case study on the business scenario. So that case study should be resembled to the business logic and that is the main task which we need to do. And once the case study is done, then we need to present the data in certain format. So most of the time, what we are just investing in our organization, okay, that is accessing the data, scrubbing the data, transform the data, manage and manage with the store and retrieve. Once this thing is done, then we are 20% doing the analysis part. So basically, SAS having different steps, like we have a data step and the proc step. So data step is typically designed to convert your raw data file to a new SAS data set and the proc step is help us to generate a report out of the SAS data set. So SAS is having a multi-vendor architecture. You can install it in your PC, workstation, mid-range server, mainframes, or any of the supercomputer. So most of the time, SaaS function, functionality is independent and 10% is dependent. As I share with you that SaaS can able to extract the data from any source, so you can able to extract the data from the DB2, Teradata, Sybase, Microsoft Excel. So any of the data, wherever you are going to store it, you will able to access it. So in short, if I try to uh, make you understand that SaaS doesn't have the database within it. So you need to have a data source with you, then only you are able to sub, uh, access those data. So basically SaaS giving us the SaaS access facility, so let me just give you a glance on it. So here we have a SaaS 9.2 which is installed within my system. 
Currently, the SAS 9.4 version is in the market. Apart from SAS Foundation tool, we have different tools like SAS Enterprise Guide and Enterprise Miner. So whenever I just open my system, so I can able to see this kind of window with the primary windows like Editor window, Log window, Output window, Explorer, and Result window. In the Editor window, we are supposed to write down the codes. The log window is to just check with the syntactical error and the data errors we can able to identify. Or in short, we can see we can able to audit our program as well. And in the output window, we are able to see the output, the generated by any program. In the explorer window, we will able to see the library, file shortcuts, favorite folder, and my computer. In libraries, we have the set of data set. We have different data set which is present within the library. So if we I, if I just open one data set for you, so you are able to see the data values as well. At the topmost, you can see the variable names which is declared as employee ID, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four likewise, and we have observations. So different observations are present in there. So basically, if I just want to see the descriptive portion of any of the SAS data set, so I just write down one uh, procedure that is called proc content. Data is equal to, I need to define the library name, that is the Orion. And I want to check this data descriptive portion, that is the employees underscore donation. So dot employees underscore donation and semicolon run semicolon so this is a general syntax to write down any of the steps within this SAS environment if you see I just write down a keyword called proc contents so whenever I used to write down any proc step or data step I will start with the keyword called proc or the data step with the keyword data so there is a syntax rule within the SAS environment then when we start with the identifying keyword and with a semicolon that is called a statement so proc contents is a statement in which we are calling a data set from the orion library name as employees underscore donation so once i submit this program for submission you can see there is a at the top there is an icon with the running first mode so you can submit it i guess there is some is employees underscore donation. So you can see I have total 124 observations present in that data set, seven variables, and the data set when it is created, when it is modified, the name of the exist in this data set, and the exact location where my data set is stored and the different types of variable which is present within my data set and there are different attributes like type, length, format, label, etc. So we can able to browse those descriptive portion with the help of proc content. So let's talk about the predictive modeling for the BFSI and the market research. Basically in the banking, finance, security or insurance, we need to understand the key objective area. Basically, in the banking domain, if you talk about most of the time, because banking is one of the financial institute, which is just helping us to check the inflow of the money within the market. Okay. Basically, uh, as a, uh, con a customer within the bank, I may have the different types of account, maybe the checking account, saving account, or any kind of current account. Okay. In the financial, because in the financial domain, they used to uh, create some resources for their organization. Okay. In the securities, there are different types of bond, debentures are available in the market. And insurance, we have, basically insurance is just a paperwork which we need to do to uh, ensure something for the future risk management. In the market research, we may be going to identify the different market segment and we need to go with the uh, prospective customer for us 
if I am just going to launch a new product, so who will be my target audience or the target customer for me? Okay, so these are the some of the things which we are going to see now. So this is our today's agenda related to the BFSI and marketing domain. So basically, when we talk about analytics, so we are going with the supervised classification. In the supervised classification, we have different types of data like training data set, test data set. So first, we need to find out the test data set or test cases from the data. We need to just make them train for the next verification. So in the any of the predictive modeling, if you talk about supervised classification, we are just trying to make the values learn something. Then we need to know how this learning is going to help us to get some new records. Okay, so basically if you just check, we have input variable. That is basically we have x1, x2, x3, x4 variable. And here we have the y variable, which having the primary target. So when we are just talking about any of the uh, Predictive modeling, so we need to go with the two things. See, in the predictive modeling, we are going to check in with the dependent variable. Dependent variable or we call them as outcome variable with independent variable. We call them as a predictor. So your outcome may be categorical or continuous type. But you, uh, whenever we have a dependent variable or outcome variable, there should be a single variable where we are supposed to identify. In the predictors, we have the categorical as well as the continuous type data. They may be have single or multiple variables. <laughs> As I discussed with you about the supervised classification, in the supervised classification, first we need to train our data. Then we need to uh, identify or generalize the data for the future aspect. That is called a prediction, which we are just trying to make it out. I hope you people understand. So. Can you able to help me with the chat box that you can just write down some comments on this part? Uh, guys, please help me with the understanding because I am just going through with the slide only and I'm discussing few points with you. So if you people are comfortable and uh, understanding the point, please let me know or I will just repeat it again. Please use your chat box so you can able to communicate with me. Hello, Ashwini. Hello. Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yes, I'm able to hear you. Uh, so, is you have any kind of doubts? No, so far nothing. You can go ahead. Okay. So, uh, kindly use the chat box so I can able to understand that because I guess that this is a monotone communication is going on because I'm just delivering. I'm not able to get any kind of feedback from you people. We'll do that. We'll do that on the chat box. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So guys, I'm just continue with the today's uh, session. So we have the uh, single independent, a single dependent variable and multiple independent variable. For that, we have different types of technique which we are using in the predictive modeling. So we may use the regression technique, which is commonly used in any of the domain. So we have different types of uh, regression models, like linear and non-linear regression models. regression models. In the linear regression, we have linear, single linear regression, single or multiple linear regression. 
See, generally, when we talk about a linear regression, means my graph is going on a straight path. It just follow on a straight path with a constant value. So we can able to find out those things with the help of linear regression. And we do have logistic regression. In case we have some categorical variable, which is binary in uh, nature, so we can use the logistic regression. Okay, so I'm just going to cover those uh, valuable inputs with you. So as I discussed with you, we have supervised classification. Here we have the Y variable, which is a target variable for me. That is the outcome variable. Apart from that, we have multiple input variables, so we can use them. So in the supervised classification, basically we are just selecting the test case or the test data. Then on the test data, we will just generate a training data where I will just train my target variable and then I need to generalize those things. So the data used to develop a predictive modeling consists of the set of cases such as observation and examples. Associated with each case is, in a, is a vector of input variable, namely predictor or explanatory variable, and target variable such as outcome and response. A predictive model maps the vector of input variable to the target. The target is the outcome to be predicted. So in the supervised classification, the target is referred as a class level. A predictive model assigned to each case a score or a set of score that measure the propensity, which is the case belongs to a particular class. So with two class, the target is binary and usually represent the occurrence of an event. So most of the time when we are working on the logistic regression, there is always a doubtful uh, nature because normally we have the dependent variable, which is uh, binary in nature. So that maybe we can represent from zero or one or one or two. So it is totally depends that how a modeler or a statistician just develop it. So in the generalization, now whatever we learn in our supervised classification, we are going to generalize it with the unknown cases. So with the unknown cases, we will just go with the training data. We will insert those value and try to calculate a new values or going to do some kind of forecasting or projection with the values. <laughs> so the prediction model is used on new cases where the value of the input variable are known, but the classes level are unknown. So here we have the unknown variable. The principal aim of predictive model is generalization because uh, see, there are different types of hypothesis testing which we need to put on. There may be a t-test, ANOVA, chi-square test. So these are the statistical tests which we are using to prove our hypothesis because in any of the case study which we learn that we start with the descriptive statistics where we are doing some kind of univariate analysis. Once the univariate analysis is done, then we will just train some kind of assumption on the business model. The assumptions part is very important because whatever we assume, it should follow with the, uh, some kind of uh, documented thing or some past experience. It is totally depends on the kind of a business you are working on. For example, in a banking domain, okay, so if I'm just uh, going with the credit card analysis. So in the credit card analysis, there is a call delinquency which is happening uh, with the customers. Okay, so how could I just predict that which customer is going to be delinquent with the credit uh, balance? Okay, so if he's not able to pay uh, his credit, means the uh, given credit value within a month or after two months, so that kind of uh, accounts is supposed to be delinquent in future. So we need to take care of those uh, conditions. So the uh, we. we here we need to generalize with the help of the past data to uh, to project something for the future aspect. So in contrast, the principal aim of traditional statistics analysis is inference, where we are trying to talk about confidence interval, hypothesis testing, p-values. So in the confidence interval, uh, if you people from the statistics background, so you may be heard about confidence interval and p-values, which is going side by side. Probability values is something like, uh, if you're just going with the normal distribution curve, okay, so there is called selection region and uh, rejection region. So we are going with the null and the alternative hypothesis. So when we are uh, having a probability value which is greater than 0 0.05, that is going to fall with the selection region and we will select the null hypothesis. Or if it is the probability value is 
less than or equal to 0 0.05. So that will be fall into rejection region, whereas we need to follow with the alternate hypothesis. Similarly, for the confidence interval, we will generate the confidence interval of the 95% for the null hypothesis and that means 95 percent we need to be confident while we are just going with the data so similar methods that are being used by predictive modeling are logistic regression may be used to infer how input variable affect the target so first we need to have an understanding about the relationship between random variable which is important in our predictive modeling so you need to generate the first thing is the correlation so you need to find out the correlation in between your different types of predictors or the predictors to the dependent variable or the outcome variable. So you need to discover some kind of structure or the pattern within the data. So you that is the best method to identify something called pattern. So you can go with the plotting the data points within the x and y axis. So you can able to find out the relationship between them. Okay, if it is going with the upgrade slope, so you can just go think that this is a positive kind of relationship, downgrade slope, so that is a negative kind of relationship. If there is no relationship, the data is not supposed to be matched together. So some predictive modeling methods we can use like neural networks, we can use the clustering, we can use the CAID or the CART model. CAID and CART model are specifically designed to generate your decision tree making. Okay, and we uh, nowadays we advance with our techniques, so we are also using the machine learning algorithms which help us to uh, identify the patterns within the data that uh, most of the miners are using those kind of concepts okay so sas is also provide you a platform that is called sas enterprise miner where you can just mine your things okay so the validity of predictive modeling method is assessed empirically so if a model generalizes well then the method is useful regardless of its statistical properties so basically what happens, most of the statisticians just think what if your model is successful, okay, uh, validation is going to be uh, take, uh, taken part with the generalization, okay. But we see in our kind of cases uh, that whatever the data we collect, most of the statisticians used to transform them the, the data into some different segment. And that time what happens, we are getting a valid, validation with the result. But at the time of generalization, the most of the statistical uh, outcomes fails. Okay. Or at the time of uh, validation, we may be not satisfy but when we implement on the real time scenario it is satisfied so you need to take care of those kind of concepts so let's talk about the application of the predictive modeling we can go with the target uh, marketing we can identify or predict something called attrition rates we can go for the credit scoring or the fraud detection so these are the basic things which we can uh, presented here so Predictive modeling application related to the marketing. So in the marketing, we have different types of data which we are collecting. It may be a primary or the secondary kind of data. Primary data is normally, for example, there is a point of sales which is happening in an, any of the uh, store. So that can be a primary, uh, means that that is a secondary data for me. Primary data is something which is collected through the surveys. So right, means you may be heard there are a lot of surveys which is going with the relation to the consumer uh, affinity related to any such a product. Okay. So primary research is normally comprised of your survey uh, conducting by the researcher. And the secondary data which is just collected from the different databases. Okay. It may be the data warehouse where your data is collected because of operational activity. Okay. So we can use the tar target marketing for the inputs are attribute to understand the purchase history and the demographics of each customer. So we can able to target them accordingly. We can segment the customer into likely to be respond to some offers because we then uh, we can use utilize our resource in a better way. 
we can also do some kind of churning because sometimes what happens, customers are not satisfied with our uh, services. So we need to find out the churning rates at that time. Okay, so we this predictive modeling can help us to identify then when the customer is supposed when the customer is supposed to leave our services or we may lose some customer at some point of time. So this predictive modeling can help us to do that. Then we can also go with the loyalty promotions that we can uh, give some kind of benefits to the loyal customer to get the retention rate high. Okay, so which also you means used in the target marketing segment. And the, at the new cases, there are risk is always associated, but that is called business. In the predictive modeling application for the banking, we will try to understand how to develop a credit scoring. Uh, Basic application of the credit scoring is to understand the past uh, means uh, see in the credit scoring we are just collect collecting the data from the uh, application form because normally the whoever going to apply for some kind of loan so they need to apply uh, means they need to fill some kind of forms and then they need to apply with a certain bank at the time of lo uh, loan and we can also check with the uh, some other organization about their credit limits for example in India we have the civil score so we can able to identify that the customer is uh, into a defaulter segment or a good segment uh, good segment so we can de define and define them as a bad or the good so most input variables come from the credit application or the credit reports so that's what I am just discussing with you a relevant binary target is whether the case is defaulted charged up or paid off debt means the good cases or the bad cases here we need to find out the bad cases because we are trying to find out the defaulters out of the good cases but there is some issue with the credit scoring normally what happens the we are not means it's a very biased data what we are getting in the credit scoring because normally the applicant whoever apply for the uh, some uh, certain loan okay if he is rejected at the primary level so we are not getting that kind of data so the data we are whatever we are getting is only for those application which is already been filed and who already took a loan from certain bank okay so at that time we can able to identify means that is the kind of a biased data we are getting so the credit score the main uh, aim is to just reduce the delinquency of new applicant for, for credit so in the financial domain we are just working on the different types of financial institute so there is a role we need to find out with the fraud detection the case of transaction need to be identified or the insurance claims need to be identified that is the claim is genuine or not Okay, so the inputs are the particularly the circumstances of transaction being done by any of the customer. So most of the time what we are collecting the data, so data can be a categorical or the continuous type of data, but the target variable is always uh, means most preferably it's a kind of categorical type. Out of that it is a binary target data. So we can just check with it with the help of fraudulent or not. The main aim is to anticipate the fraud or abuse of new transaction or claims so that they can be investigated or impeded. So the analytical ch challenges, because see, the analytics can be done for the two reasons. Either we need to find out some new opportunity within the market or we can be able to minimize our risk as well. So the data is very huge. It is coming from the different segment and the data is coming from the operational or the observational type of data. So the most of the data are collected because of the operation. It is not the researcher who is just uh, collecting the data with the help of survey. There are so, so many errors and outliers is present in our data. Outlier is something which is extreme values from the normal data tendency, which just generates some kind of skewness within your data. And there are some missing value which is always present in our data which creates a opposite thing within our data. So analytical challenges. So the collected data is our operational purpose that is unrelated to the statistic analysis. Such data is usually massive, dynamic and dirty. Preparing data for uh, predictive modeling can be agonized. 
So here we have the mix measurement scale. You can see here we have sales executive homemakers. So there are different types of data which we are collecting. So we need to study on that part. So when there are a large number of input variables, there are usually a variety of measurement scale represented. So basically when we are trying to uh, measure the scale, we have the different types of level of data that is called ordinal, nominal, interval and ratio. Ordinal data, uh, nominal data are those which are non-overlapping values, means those values which are uh, which you can just use as a key factor. Okay, for example, your PAN card, your ration ID, your uh, driving license, these are nom uh, nominal in nature. Then you have the ordinal value, which is having a overlapping values. So ordinal values, for example, if I'm just conducting a test, so if I'm just giving a grades to the different students, like A grade, B grade, C grade, so there are a lot of students who can fall down into A grade, B grade, C grade. So these are these kind of data are called ordinal type of data. Then we have interval and ratio. Interval data are those which we have the lower uh, and the uh, upper value. So we can define some range of for it. So data having high dimensionality because most of the time we have multiple predictors. So at that time every predictor having its own dimension. So at that time, it will be difficult for us to identify that which predictor is making a major changes in our data. So we are uh, assuming that we have X1, X2, and X3 predictors. So we can just find out some relationship between X1 and X2, X1 and X3, and X2 and X3. So if I just going to present this whole data in a single plane, so I need to use the three-dimensional form. So this is a form which we are getting. So high dimensionality will generate some kind of uh, disturbance in our understanding of pattern recognition. So the dimension refers to the number of input variables. Actually, input uh, degree is of freedom. We need to find out. See, for uh, if you have a multiple variables during your uh, test cases or during your analysis, so you can reduce it with the help of different techniques which is given in the statistics that we normally use them. Uh, for example, you have the PCA technique, okay, that we have the principal component analysis, which we can uh, generally do for identifying the uh, principal uh, component values out of it. Okay, we do have the clustering techniques. Okay, so SAS giving us different types of procedure for it. That is PROC VAR class, PROC PASS class, PROC, proc PRINT COMP. So these are the some of the procedure which is given by SAS people to uh, get a data. Means we can use them as a reduction technique within our data. So high dimensionality limit the ability to explore and model the relationship among the variable. The complexity of data set increase rapidly with increasing dimensionality. The remedy is dimension reduction. Ignore irrelevant and redundant dimension without inverting, adverting, ignoring importance. One. So normally, if you talk about a binary data, so there is two types of data which we are I means collecting. That is event and no event. So event. For example, we can just select some respondent, uh, means the customer who responds for the specific offers. We can able to find out some churning out of them. We can able to find out some kind of default or some fraud analytics. So no event, we are not, uh, means there is no response given by the customer. The customer is not going to churn, he will stay with us. So we need to understand the payoff or legitimate. So in predictive modeling, the event of interest is often rare because uh, out of uh, the whole data, maybe the 0.1%, that is a 10% of data will have a event which is supposed to be occur. So usually more data leads to better model, but having an ever larger number of non-event cases has rapidly diminishing the return and can even have the detrimental effect. So a seemingly massive data set might have the predictive potential of one that is much smaller. So we can go with the widespread strategy for predicting rare events to build a model on a sample that disproportionate. Okay, so you can able to find out different types of data or the test cases for yourself, which you are going to introduce uh, later on for the generalization purpose. 
as i discussed with you we have linearity and non linearity kind of regression so this is a linear which is a straight line as a slope we we are able to see and there is a non linear kind of framework okay so non linear we may have cubic or kind of quadratic kind of dispersion in our data so predictive modeling is a multivariate problem because we are using more than one variable each important dimension might affect the target in complicated ways moreover the effect of each in input variable might depend on the value of other input variable the curse of dimensionality makes it difficult to untangle many classical modeling methods including standard logistic regression were developed for input and effect that have a constant rate of change and do not depend on any other inputs so for example if you see in this slide you can see that we have a straight slope which is we call as a best fit line so this is a just right or we may have some overfitting model or we may have some underfitting model see sometime what happen when we generate some kind of model so we need to identify that whatever the model we generate it should be the just right fit for us okay so that we call as a best fit so either we may have some overfitting or underfitting which is happening with our data so that will not give us the right result so i guess you people having a question for the overfitting and underfitting if you have so you can ask me later on after the end of the session so predictive modeling typically involves choice from among a set of model this might be different types of model this might be different complexity of model at the same time a common pitfall is to overfit the data that is to use too complex a model and overlay uh, complex model to be sensitive to particular in the sample data set and not generalize well to new data using too simple model however can lead to underfitting where true features are disregarded so let's go with the predictive uh, modeling with the financial distress char characterization model so i'm going to discuss with you one of the topic that is very uh, excellent in the banking uh, in the financial domain that is called bankruptcy okay so we will just trying to understand what is bankruptcy first then accordingly we will uh, more do some kind of test on the saas platform so first we need to have an understanding about what is called financial distress the financial distress is very uh, and means a very common term in the financial domain because uh, if you see that in when the us market is shut down okay so whole global area means the people will suffer from the financial distress okay so there are different types of topic which we are covering in this particular domain that is called discriminant analysis logit and probit qualitative response model and some data i am just sharing with you regarding the financial statement data which is collected by the account sections okay so we earn money with a very hard work we just use some kind of foreclosures broke or bankruptcy just shaken up okay so corporate is just facing this kind of a activity in their uh, in their hardcore work okay so there is a financial corporate they used to do so in the finance corporate finance if you talk about we will going to generate some kind of portfolio theory hagging capital structure and valuation so we need to uh, go with this kind of idea then we are able to uh, minimize our risk involved within our uh, in involved within our uh, getting a some kind of resource from the market so corporate finance is the area of finance dealing with the source of funding and the capital structure of the corporation and the actions that managers takes to increase the value of the firm to the shareholder as well as the tools and analysis used to allocate financial resources in corporate finance the most interesting topic is research concerned with the bankruptcy and its prediction so we are going to understand what is bankruptcy and its prediction with the help of some kind of module that is proc discrim proc logistic and proc probit so bankruptcy can result from a firm not being able to make a required bond payment or from a desire of management to restructure its financial obligations 
So, what are the different causes of bankruptcy? Bankruptcy itself can have different causes. Most causes are preceded by a firm inability to meet one or more of its financial obligations. So, we can just characterize the financial distress uh, by the investors in a firm equity or bond instrument. It is also useful for potential acquiring entities, institution granting credits or credit rating, and policymakers. So we are just using the Z-score for general understanding. You can see Z-score model uses liquidity, debt, and operational performance ratio in a discriminant function framework. When you have a more money in the market, so at that time, the chances of debts are very high. Okay, so your operational performance ratio may be going upward or the downward. It totally depends on how you are utilizing your resources. So we are going to characterize the financial distress with help of these kind of models. So let's go with the data first. I'm just creating a library for myself with the help of libname. And I'm giving a name called finance. I have a data here of one of the financial data. So I just run this program. So you can see I have a library with the name of finance is being assigned by the libname statement. So libname is basically a global statement which help us to define a library for ourselves. So if I just open it, we have a data called HW fail, which is we are going using uh, we are going to use this as a program. So you can see we have different types of variables here, distress dummy that we just I just created this as a dummy variable where zero is the event and one is the no, no event. So depth to asset, employ uh, growth rate. So there are different variables which is being presented here. So let me just uh, go with this slide. So we are having a data consists of different firm which define as financial distress if it meets at least one of the following condition. So actual debt default management negotiation with the creditor to restructure terms of debt instruments, difficulty in meeting the payments requirement of debt contract. So this data is basically collected from the period 1981 to 1989 from the NYSE or the MX. So this sample consists of the 181 manufacturing firm out of which 86 are classified as a financial distress. So the data's distress firms are gathered approximately one year prior to the exhibiting the first sign of distress. So we are just collecting the data in the uh, means data values from the 1981 from uh, to the 1989. So whatever the data is collecting in the 1981, that is of the data of 1980 actually. And in the 1989, it is the data from 1988. So one year before the data has been collected. So due to the acquisition, we have 37 firms. We have 44 bankruptcy firms. Apart from that, 100 random firms are also added in this particular data. So identify, to, to nullify the data basically, so five out, uh, out of the 100 were classified as distressed. So the total set of 181 firms include 56 distressed firms, uh, distressed firms and 95 healthy firms. So we are going to analyze our data with the help of liquidity, debt, manager efficiency, and profitability. So these are the uh, specific measurement we are using. So these are the variables which is being collected in our data set. So YD is basically a distress dummy, which equals one for distress and zero for healthy firm. So one is the, uh, we just consider one as an event and zero as non-event, okay? Because here we are just going to identify the distress firm. And TDTA is the basically debt to total asset ratio. GMPL is firm one year's employee growth rate. So these are the different variables which we are going to see in our uh, data set itself. So we are just start working on it. So first we are just going with the univariate analysis. So for univariate analysis, we have PROC univariate, which help us to generate those things. So I'm going with the PROC univariate data is equal to, that is the finance dot 
S W F A I L E D. Then, because I need to check with the all the variables distribution, so I am just not using one statement called var statement. So var is a statement which specifically selecting the numeric variable, but here uh, and we can limit the variable distribution. But I just want to check with the all the variables. So first, let's go with the proc content to understand how many variables and observation are present in our data. So here we can see we have total 181 observations and 15 variables. So we can able to uh, get the descriptive portion with the help of proc content, which I already discussed with you people. These are the different labels for the different variables. Okay, so I'm just going with the class variable that is yd. So because yd is my uh, outcome variable, I'm just using with the class statement. Class statement is basically used for the classification. I can use the histogram to understand the data distribution. Histogram, uh, then I can declare the variable names. So I'm using underscore all underscore uh, histogram. Then I need to declare the variable names. For example, I want to check with the sum of the variable like TDTA. T -D -T -A. Okay. Slash normal so you can see this is a wondering a uh, wonderful things about SAS. I just submit a few lines of code that is proc area data of finance dot sw field so it just given us the massive output. If you can see, we are uh, having the different movements. That is the descriptive part of the statistics and mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum values. Apart from that, <laughs> we have mean, median, mode. Then we have test statistics as well. Okay, my statistics is just going with the probability values of 0 0.001. So it means that I need to select the alternate hypothesis instead of null hypothesis. So we have the quartiles in a different quarters we do have the lowest and the highest value. Okay, so we can able to identify our outliers out of this. Here we have the uh, movements for the TDTA. So this is for the, means the different values are being identified. Okay, see, it is difficult to read out everything in the output window, so I'm just generating a, a PDF file out of it. So I will generate ODS, PDF, file is equal to ODS, PDF, close. So ODS is just providing you the, out, uh, means it stands for output delivery system, which help, us, uh, help you to generate an output, whatever the output is generated in a specific format. So I'm just using this file location only. I'm just giving a dataset name as wfailfail.pdf. So you can see I have a PDF file now with me. I can open it. I can able to study this PDF for my understanding. So here you can just check with it that you want to check with TDTA with the uh, YD is equal to zero. That is the, del I mean, the distress forms. And this is the YD is equal to one. That is the not distress form, okay? So you can just check with the different extreme values and those things, okay? So you can go any of it and you can able to identify the basic differences, okay? so. This is very general in the, to identify the descriptive statistics from our uh, data. So now I'm just going to conduct one t-test within our data. So t-test is just uh, help us to identify the basic mean difference in between the two samples. 
So here we have, have uh, we are having the two uh, things that is called dummy distress variable. We have this. So in the dummy distress variable, uh, we have the zero and one, where one is representing as a distress firm and zero is representing as a healthy firm. Okay. So I'm using the t test result. So instead of univariate, I'm just writing the prop t test. See the wonderful thing about SAS is most of the uh, SAS syntax are the same. Okay, you need not need to worry about that. You just need to understand the uh, default nature of these SAS uh, syntaxes. So let me just make you go through the t-test result. So this is a t-test result. Okay, where you are just go uh, going to have your n mean standard deviation, standard error, minimum and maximum value. Here you have the confidence interval that your value if lies in between them then you are 95 percent confident that the data is being picked up from the means the sample data is picked up from the population and here you have the t-test result so in the t-test result if you see my probability values are lies within the range of 0 .005, 0 0.05 that is basically the alternate hypothesis we need to select in the cases. So we have the pooled and the straight weight uh, kind of method which we can use it. And in here we can just check with the different thing. Like this is a depth to asset. In the depth to asset, we having the same kind of result. So you can directly click on it. You will have the same result. In the employee growth rate, you have the t test result. That is your employee growth rate is also having the significant t-test result means your probability values is lies within it and in the income you have the t-test result so here also it is very significant but exactly what this t-test is helping us to identify that is the point so basically when we talk about the t-test value so t-test is just giving you the result that, <laughs> that your data is significant at the specific probability values or not Okay, so let me just go make you go through the slide. <laughs> so we are using this variable to characterize the financial distress with the numerous traditional accounting ratio and measure of firm size. The accounting ratio covers liquidity, debt, managerial effectiveness, and profitability measures. Each measure has been shown to have some relevance for characterizing the financial distress in different studies. Because the purpose of, of this analysis is to gauge the efficacy of the financial characterization in classifying firms in financial distress, the data are sorted based on the financial distress classification. That is the purpose of the analysis to determine whether the financial ratios or variable can help determine whether a firm is classified as either distressed, either healthy or not distressed, either healthy or distressed. So we are going with the univariate analysis. We are using the PROC T test. So this type of analysis is used to find the indication of whether there are a difference between the financial variable across the two samples. So we have uh, two types of data that is called YD is equal to zero and YD is equal to one. That is uh, healthy and the distress firm. We can use the PROC T test, can uh, identify the statistically significant difference of mean on non univariate analysis. We use it where to test whether some of the variable are different from distress firm or not. So output from the practice test can be broken into three distinct sections. The first is to generate statistical summary information for each variable. You see that, that we have n mean standard deviation, uh, standard error, minimum and maximum value. If you observe here, this is the statistical things which we are getting through. And you can find out the difference as well here, the difference of among set okay so you can find out the distress minus uh, this is a distress minus healthy so the difference is genuinely there is a difference of the mean okay so t test is used for the difference calculating the difference of mean so the statistical difference between the mean across the two groups the two tests are calculated and assume equal variance between the two classes 
assume unequal variance between the two classes. It contains test statistics for the null hypothesis that the variance across groups are equal. So we are just going with the statistics that the variance across the groups are not equal because we have a probability values of less than 0.005. So, so far the univariate result indicates that a large number of financial variables are different between the distressed and the healthy firm. However, this analysis does not take into account interaction between those variables. Therefore, we consider different multivariate method. So, uh, basically what happened? We just tried to identify the difference between the mean of two samples in uh, distress and the healthy firm. But that is not giving any kind of interaction in between the distress and healthy firm. If we want to get an interaction between them, so we will go with the multivariate analysis. In the multivariate analysis, we have discriminant analysis, logistic regression, and probit uh, relationship. So in the logistic regression and probit, uh, we have the logit link function and probit link function. So I will discuss it later. So we have the discriminant analysis. So PROC discrim helps us to generate classification scheme using discriminant analysis. This method uses multiple variables as input to classify each observation into one or more groupings. When the analyst has identified whether the sample forms are distressed or healthy. So discriminant analysis may help to characterize the classification. So we have the PROC discrim. So let's go with the PROC discrim. So I'm just copy this program. This is the same thing. There is no differences if you observe. I'm just using the proc discrim. I just use the a title and I use the class YD as well here. I did not use the var statement because I'm not conf confirmed that which variable is helpful to identify the uh, major dis distress portion. So we have the fin nance. Dot as I'm also generating a PDF for this as well to read it clearly. It is a discriminant analysis. So I'm using the discrim. So when I submit this program, it's supposed to generate a result for me in the form of PDF. I can check with it. Here we have the discriminant analysis result. You can see we have the uh, total number of sample size out of which how many variables and classes been defined. So we have two classes that is 0 and 1. And we have total 14 variable which has been uh, used in this particular uh, example. So if you just check in the class level information, so total number of uh, non healthy firms are 95 and total number of non healthy firms means the distress firms are 86. We just go, got a weight of same value that is 95 over 86 and we can just have a proportion for it. Earlier, the probability proportion is 50-50%, but when we have the specific frequency of distress and non-distress form, so we can generate. For example, I can see you with the calculator. So your proportion for this particular frequency weight is 95 divided by 181. So 0 0.524.86 value is the proportion for the this value means uh, your healthy firms. And for distress firm, it is 86 divided by 181, which is your 47% uh, somewhat around. Okay, so you can see earlier the probability was 50-50, but after that, it's just giving a proportion of this. We have the pooled covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is help us to generate some SCCP that is a covariance correlated matrix which we are just helping us to identify the clustering form if we generate any kind of uh, graphical portion. 
Here you can see we have the generalized square distance of yd. Basically what happens, this result of discriminant analysis can also be used to generate some kind of uh, cluster module. But here we only have the value of 1 or 0. So we cannot be comfortable with the value of this. That 1.923 uh, is only value. Because if we have the multiple uh, level of the same variable, so we can able to identify. So here we have the linear discriminant function of yd, which is also being generated. So you can study uh, further about it. And this is the important result for me. Okay, because here we need to find out the number of uh, distressed firm. So you can see that uh, we have total 17 number of distressed firm in these year, means the uh, first category, we have the 17 number of distressed firm where we have these 18% of the value. Okay, and the next one, if you see, there is a 30% uh, uh, of the healthy, which is uh, just having some value of 35%. Uh, okay, so total, if I am just uh, calculating this value, so you can able to identify uh, 173. So total 73, around 73 uh, distress firm we are getting out of it. Okay, so we have 73 distress firm and 108 non-distress firm. So let me just go through the slide. So the output from the product screen, I already discussed with you about the weight and the proportions and the prior probabilities. And the second section starts by describing the generalizing between the square distance between groups. So in our example, involve only two groups. We cannot judge whether the 1.92349 signifies much. Next, it describes the linear discriminant function, which lists the classification scheme. So this is the linear discriminant function for the classification of the values according to their constant. So we can use them within the equation. So finally, the information that tells us that the most related to the error rate generated by the linear discriminant model. So this is uh, our finding. To get a better uh, impression of the predictability of the analysis, see in the descriptive model, we are not going to check with the, any kind of hypothesis or the probability value. We are only checking with the uh, statistical, we are not getting any kind of statistical power out of it. Okay, so although product scheme uh, may be helpful to identify distress firm, the model little to say about the statistical power of its application. So for statistical power, we can go with the logit and the probit model. So we have the uh, yd as a distress, that is the response variable, and different types of uh, independent variable are used. So both logit and probit model, basically logit and probit are called the link function. Okay, so there is a logit link function which is going with the log value transformation of the values. Basically what happens when you talk about a regression model, so regression having the continuous figures. Okay, if you are dependent and independent variable, you have the continuous value. But in uh, logistic regression, your dependent will be categorical. Here we have the two categories, that is the distress and the healthy firm. Okay, so we are just trying to transform them into uh, some kind of linear, uh, with the help of a linear function of logic link function. Okay, so the model probability of certain response, in this case one or zero, as a function of the independent variable. So basically what happens, we need to convert into dummy, but it's already been converted. Both assume that the underlying response is unobservable and that only the qualitative response here one or zero can be observed. The two methods then differ in their respective assumptions about how the observed dummy variable is related to unobservable true response. So logit assumes that the true response is a linear function of the independent variable plus a logit error term. Probit assumes a normal distributed error term. So this is a logistic model. So here in the logistic model, I am not using all the variables present in our data set. We are just using few variables and we are just trying to evaluate with the help of R squared. So R squared change is very important in our logistic model. 
See, the syntax of the SAS is very uh, similar. You just need to identify their uh, default nature. So I'm using the proc logistic model. You can see I just use a keyword called model. So model is help us to generate the dependent variable is equal to independent variable. So if I just go in with the definition of a model, so model is helping us to generate the dependent uh, variable is equal to in uh, multiple independent variable independent variable 1 plus independent variable 2 plus independent variable 3 likewise okay so we have multiple independent variable can be added with some errors okay so this is a general uh, understanding about models so your dependent variable will be studied with the help of multiple independent variables and with error. But here we are just, uh, means whenever we are coding in our SAS, so we will always consider the error is equal to zero. So we are just going to code this thing that we have the TDTA, GEMPL, OPITA. So these are the variables which help us to identify uh, the change in the YD. Okay, so I'm just running the logistic model here itself so I'm using logit ODS PDF close So if you check, we have the logic PDF. In the logistic regression, we use the distress uh, dummy as a response variable, and the number of responses are two, so it's a binary logit function. So logit link function we using. So optimization technique is a Fisher scoring, which is a default one. We have different types of technique. Here we have the total number of distress and the uh, total number of healthy firms. So we have total number of distress firm is 86 and the healthy firm is 95. So this is a conversion statistics. So you can see there is a model fit statistics which is very much important for us. We have AIC, SC and the minus two log L. So AIC is basically called ACAI uh, information criteria and the SC is the Swazian criteria. So both are help us to identify the intercept and their covariates. Okay, so these are the value. But as I discussed with you that here we are just using the logistic function to identify the change within the value. So we will go with the R square. So R square we having the 31.83, whereas the re max resale R square is 0 0.4248. Uh, so 42% of the R square change we are observed with these variables. So what exactly this mean, means to we, uh, us? That if we are using these variables as a model within the uh, for the identifying the distress and the healthy firm, so we are only 42% confirmed. So still 68% is missing. Uh, 58% is missing. So maybe there are some more better fit uh, variable for us which we can use as a model and which will give us some kind of direct and uh, means changes. So you can see here we have the test statistics, we have the likelihood ratio, score and the wall statistics. All of them are selecting uh, means uh, giving you a better idea about that your data can select with the alternate hypothesis. So all of them fall below to the 0 0.05 values. Okay, so you can check here, you have the TDTA which having a negative estimate value, basically their negative coefficient. So if you just uh, selecting these value, okay, inside your model, for example, because my uh, what the model I developed, here we have the dummy variable. is equal to your different models. So you can select out of it and you can work on it, okay. So uh, guys, due to short of time, I'm not going, it means I'm not able to discuss in a length uh, within the SAS programming. Okay, so I already share everything within the slide. So I'm just running with the slide and I will share with you, okay. So these are the some outputs which we are generating. 
So here you can see we have the same uh, means characteristics of the probability values. Okay, and here you have the TDT as a negative value. So the association of predicted probabilities and observed response you can check. We have 83% of the uh, classified observations, that is the uh, percentage concurrent, which appear to be improvement over the 74% of success rate. See, earlier what we are just getting with the discriminant analysis, we are only getting the 74% of success rate. But here we have the 83% of the success rate with the logistic regression model. Here we can use the probit model. The things are all same. Model YD is equal to the same value. I use the lag fit here. So it's just giving us the same kind of result. If you observe, we have the uh, different confidence interval. So the probability result largely agree with the largest one, but the model explanatory power is not significant. Nevertheless, the sign of the estimated coefficients are the same as those in the logistic regression. You can see here we also having the negative value for the TDTA and invest. So the purpose is to illustrate how to use SAS to characterize the determ determinant of the financial distress. We presented three common methods, discriminant, logit, and the probit analysis. In the discriminant analysis, it's generally a direct link between variable and classification, but does not allow much hypothesis testing. But in logistic and probit, they allow hypothesis testing, but depend on distributional assumption about error terms. So let's go with the introduction to the market research analysis application. So in the market research analysis application, SAS provides us the point and click environment. If you just see when we are going in the SAS, we have the solutions. In the solution, we can click on analysis. We can generate our analysis, design of experiment, investment analysis, market research. So if I click on market research, so it will open a new window for me. We have different types of uh, data set which is already present in the SaaS user. I have tires, I have price. So let me just do one uh, market analysis research for you. I'm just performing a conjoint analysis. In the conjoint analysis, we are just trying to map the preference of the customer. So which, uh, if we just observe this data set, let's observe the data set first. We have SaaS user. Here we have uh, tires. In the tires, we have different brands, that is the tire max, good trends, and the rolls ahead. Their charges, their prices, and the mileage. We just selected seven different consumer who just given us some kind of ranking for these different branded. So we need to find out that which customer preferred which brand on the basis of charges, price, and mileage. I hope you people understand now. I'm repeating again, we have three brands, that is Tarmax, Good Trends, and Rolls Ahead. And we have the charges, that is the installation charges, the price of each brand, and the mileage they are providing. And we are selecting seven consumers who rank them. So we, have, we just note them as a rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four. So we have seven consumers who rank them according to, to their preference, okay? So let's uh, go with the conjoint analysis. So in the conjoint analysis, we will go with the, uh, means after selecting tires, we go, can go with the conjoint analysis. Okay, so I need to select the qualitative attributes and the preference metrics. Okay, so in the qualitative attributes, we are using the brand, charge, brand, charges, price, and mileage as an attribute. And the rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four, rank five, rank six, rank seven as a preference. Okay, so these are the uh, basic thing which I done. I click on OK, so it will generate a box plot for me. If you see that the people are preferably looking for the mileage, that is a 49.0 percent, and then they are looking for the price, then they are looking for the brand, and then the charges. So 49.0 percent people are says means out of this uh, seven consumer, they say that 49% they, they will be go with the mileage, that the tire should give the mileage to them. If I right click on it, it will give us the result. I can just select the utility table. In the utility table, it's just giving us the preference for each ranks, okay? So here we have the brand, so they will go with the good print, trades first, okay? 
and then he will go with the zero uh, percent of charges, forty-five dollars he want to pay, and the mileage forty thousand. Okay, so accordingly he will go with this kind of scenario. Similarly, for the rank two, the good reads uh, will go. Uh, he will also go with the good read. He don't want to pay the charges in the first preference. Then the price he will go with the forty-five dollar and forty thousand. So these are this some outcome which he will able to visualize with the result. Again, I click on result. Then I can go with the utility plots. So you can see the utility plots for each and every customer. So the rank one go with the good read, then rolls ahead, then tire max. Okay. So we can select according to brand, according to charges, mileage, and price and mileage. Okay. So you can see for the mileage, they are going with the forty thousand to sixty thousand, and then. Eighty thousand. So this is a preference for the rank seven. But if you just select with the rank one, he is quite a bit sloppy. Okay, you can see it is the rank one information. You can select your symbols as well. Okay, where they are just making a change. Okay, and you can also get a, a result of ANOVA table. So in the ANOVA table, you will able to identify. That uh, which of the values are significant? So you can see all of them are significant. Rest only this is not significant because the value is more than probability of zero point two. You can also go with the uh, market share stim uh, simulation. In the market share simulation, you can just select. See, this is the market share for each and everything. Uh, every. Customer, so 57 percent of the market share is depends on the charges, prices, and mileage. So if a consumer means if a uh, dealer just providing us the 7.5 percent charges on the good trades and the price is 75 dollar and he only giving a mileage, so it's giving us a max maximum market share of 57.1 percent. If I want to evaluate again, so I can add all. Okay, so you can see for the prediction part. So for the prediction part, the market share is being not changed. Okay, so the market remain the same for this prediction part as well. So this is a general understanding that how to use the point and click environment. Okay, so I'm just going with this slide. So we are going to perform the conjoint and discrete choice analysis. In life, knowledge is a power. In business, knowledge is profit. So this is a very simple quotation from my side. So market research focus on assessing the preference and the choice of consumer and potential consumers. So SaaS provide us different verticals like analytics, econometrics, data visualization. So here we are just doing the forecast means the understanding the market preference. So most of the time it is me who is just uh, wondering that who is my customer, what he want from me, where he will come from, why he is looking for a specific product, when he is going to purchase, make a purchase. So these are the some of the questions which is always come into my mind. So in the conjoint analysis, we used to evaluate consumer preference. If I had known they wanted me to use all this info, I would never ask for it. So this is my uh, some quote. Uh, quote I will do. So basically, in the preference, we are just going with the outcome. In the attributes, we have the different predictors. So we are using the tires data set in the SAS user from the SAS user library. So we have different brand names, uh, expected trend, purchase price, installation cost. So brands are good trades, rolls ahead, tires max. And as I discuss uh, with you that how to go with the market research, you can directly click on it. Then you can go with the tires conjoint analysis. So these are the basic steps which I perform. So you can see the same result that 49% of the mileage is the topmost. Okay, so people are preferring the mileage first, then price, then brand, then charges. So these are the uh, some utility plots being developed. Okay. 
so you can also go with the market share stimulation so you can able to estimate it means you can able to find out the estimating market share if you're just predicting something for the future so discrete chart analysis is basically customer preference on the basis of sub choices if you given okay here in the uh, means the conjoint analysis we are only checking with the preference but if you're giving choices so which choice you will meet so this example has choice possibility defined by two attributes price and brand so five choices alternatives are presented at a time to a respondent from which one alternative is chosen eight of these choice sets are presented each one with a different set of five combination of price and brand so we are going with the price we selected the data so we just use the different choice attributes okay so if you select see that the brand 4 is coming as the topmost then brand 1 then brand 2 and brand 3 so these are the different uh, attributes its significance so you can see your statistics as well and here you have the maximum likelihood ratios uh, score and wall all are similar because we are using the uh, choices which is also kind of a uh, means binary in a binary so you can use the logistic regression directly with the data so these are the set of the brands which is being uh, used so thank you for the today's session okay i'm done with my presentation so if you people having any kind of doubts or query you can ask me uh, directly you can do one thing you can just send your queries to the chat box so i can reply it or i can do one thing send your queries to me i will just uh, drop you an email with an a proper explanation hello hello yeah hello who's this narish narish yeah narish hi how are you i'm fine sir how are you yeah i'm doing well narish thanks for asking yeah, Yeah, Nareesh, so tell me. So, how how was the presentation? And any Hello. questions you have? Hello, Nareesh. Name from the session. Hello. Yeah, Nareesh, I'm hearing you. Hello. Hello, uh, Nareesh. Very, very attentive. Uh, session is very interesting. Okay. Hello. Nareesh, just do one thing. You can just write on the uh, chat box. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Nareesh, go ahead. <laughs> Nareesh, am I audible to you? Yes, sir. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Nareesh, uh, would you like to share some feedback, or you want to ask me some questions? Sir, that's what I want to say. Yep. Go ahead. That uh, how it is uh, relevant. Yeah. Pharma. Pharma. Yep. Okay. See Nareesh, in the pharmaceuticals, uh, we are. Really yeah in the pharmaceutical we have the clinical research trials okay which is just helping us to uh, find uh, means do yeah. some drug development new drug development okay we normally call it as ndd okay that we will have a later on session or you can just drop an email to my id so i can share some valuable inputs on that part so today we have only a bfsi and the marketing model so if you have any kind of query or the question you can ask me Thank you. Hello, Ashwini. Hello. Yeah, Ashwini. Hi. How are you? Uh, I'm good, sir. How about you? Yeah. Thank. Uh, I'm good. Thanks for asking. So, Ashwini, uh, any doubts? Any query? Uh, for me, basically, it is much of you know advanced analytic stuff, logistic and okay. all that. But I yeah. understand all this, and then the last the last part of it was uh, no, little more interesting because I understand that. Okay. <laughs> because. yeah basically uh, in the market research we used to do the conjoint discrete there is a corresponding analysis lot of analysis is there okay but uh, because of the short of time i just shared some of the key insight 
okay and uh, in the meanwhile you can uh, if you have any query you can drop me an email on my email id i just wanted to ask one question you know you have actually sure. used some data sets to do analysis right like yeah for that, for that you know in the financial explanation also you have used some companies what is present with our lg right that's true just see to check, this is see uh ashwini uh, what happens when we are getting a data a data into a raw format okay there is a data preparation cycle we need to follow right. okay so in the data preparation cycle there are a lot of things we need to consider sometime uh, we need to do some missing value imputation sometime we need to uh, create some new variable okay that is called uh, derived variables okay we need to delete some observations so these are the basic thing which we used to do or uh, there are transformation need to be done with some of the variable if they are skewed a very skewed data okay so these are the basic thing which we are just uh, doing with our uh, day to day activity in our data manipulation so as i discussed with you the 80% of the time we are only investing with the data manipulation okay 20% is the only time for analysis once your data is prepared you will bang on you will go on with the data okay understood yeah any further query and no, if you not access okay. okay thank you thanks a lot thanks for attending the session so guys i'm just uh, finished with today's session if you have any feedbacks or any questions or anything you can just share with me on the chat box